Hey Corey, I wanted to chime in on this issue of uh, final causality in biological evolution. It's one of my favorite things to talk about uh, and, and to write about. And I think, you know, often when I first enter a discussion with um, a more uh, modern minded person who's taking a neo Darwinian perspective, um, the first thing I usually say is, well, look, let's go back to Aristotle. And they'll say, well, no, modern physics has proven that Aristotle was mistaken about the nature of uh, the cosmos. Um, and so they'll say the idea of actually taking seriously that there are four uh, reasons that things are, or four causes underlying the emergence of all phenomena, especially organisms and artifacts. And, and organisms and artifacts, uh, the, the analogies which we make between the two has basically constituted the foundations of biology since the beginning, and it still does. Um, an organism originally w would, was considered more like a work of art in Aristotle's age, and it was a self-making work of art um, that contained within itself uh, its own striving to become. Um, organisms, unlike uh, human artifacts, though, never are finished until they die, uh, but then their form decays and disappears. But while they live, the form is always, uh, uh, Aristotle called this entelechy, or at least that's the English translation. Um, what it, it means is that an organism is always becoming itself but never actually doing so, um, because if it did, it would it would be frozen like a like a statue, right? So an organism is like a work of art, uh, but continually self-making. Now in the modern age, an organism became to seem more like a machine, um, and eventually like a computer. And so, for example, uh, Daniel Dennett says that organisms uh, are uh, accumulation of genetic algorithms and an algorithm is a recipe for action uh, so basically the idea is that it originally came from Dawkins but uh, Dennett and many others have sort of appropriated it and began uh, begun even applying it to culture and this idea of mimetic evolution um, cultural evolution as a mere repetition or mimicry of ideas that catch on for what are ultimately biological reasons. So then, you know, you eventually get into sociobiology or evolutionary psychology, um, you know, with scholars like uh, E.O. Wilson and Steven Pinker. Um, but it, it seems as though the way we uh, analogize about life determines in large part how we live it. And so if you take the Darwinian picture, uh, the positivist picture of life as mere uh, consumption and reproduction, and the consumption part factor factors in this Malthusian idea of limited resources and competition, right? Um, and the reproduction part today has been reduced to the random, you know, there's variation because genes randomly mutate. Um, and the, the whole organism and all of its behavior, and apparently including its consciousness, is contained as a code, a transcendent code, a digital algorithm in the, the, the genome. Um, so the idea is that the, the genome computes the organism. Um, you know, theoretically, we don't have computers that are actually fast enough to do this, but this is the theory, right? And, you know, some biologists have criticized this, uh, not only for the reasons that I mentioned about, you know, um, Aristotle's four causes still being relevant, uh, but for reasons like, uh, well, Richard Lewontin, for example, a biologist at uh, Harvard, I think, um, says, you know, for example, that DNA, um, contrary to popular assumptions, doesn't make anything and is not self-replicating. 
DNA is one of the most inert molecules we have ever discovered. Outside of its cellular matrix, outside of that whole system of, of uh, structure and function and, and proteins, um, DNA falls apart. Uh, it's an inert molecule. And so what Lewontin would point out with what he calls dialectical biology is that there's circular causality taking place within the cell. Now, Kant said this hundreds of years ago, um, but we, we've had to relearn it that when you're talking about an organism, um, it is the cause and effect of its own operations, and it contains within its own self-made membrane uh, various components which produce that membrane and produce themselves. Uh, you know, this has also been developed in Maturana and Varela's theory of autopoiesis, and it's it's a systemic approach to biology rather than a reductionistic one, um, like say Dawkins or Dennett. And what it does is allow us to recognize uh, the whole, um, the whole as the active uh, living being who does have this entelechy, this uh, sense of well, desire and of love. Uh, Matron and Varela developed a whole theory of cognition based on their biological theory of autopoiesis and it was a biology um, or a, a culture rooted in biology based on love and social reciprocity and respect and understanding uh, as, as a primary value. So they were basing this on, on what they deemed to be biological facts, uh, that what makes us human is our capacity to relate to one another. Um, and because of the explosion of, of technology and um, the separation of technology from art in Aristotle's day, you know, um, technology and uh, artistry were not really broken apart yet into these separate activities. So technology has gone off on its own, become its own social force. And even it, it's more than a social force, it's, uh, it is what surrounds and encompasses uh, and in large part determines the rest of society. We exist inside of technology, various sorts of technologies, you know, going back maybe most uh, foundationally to our own language, our alphabetic technology. Um, so it's, it's such a force today that we've uh, taken for granted much of what it means to be alive. Our lives have become so regulated and autonomous that, you know, it almost seems appropriate to call them machine-like. But when you're able to appreciate the, you know, sort of phenomenological and embodied experiential facts of your existence, the sort of mechanistic picture no longer seems, uh, I mean, uh, granted, it's useful, technically useful. We can manipulate the genes and change organisms, but we don't always know how to predict exactly what our change is going to cause, because our understanding of life is far less than our technical skill, our ability to manipulate it. And, you know, when I say we should, and, and I agree with you, Corey, that we should hearken back to Aristotle's understanding of life. It's not to say that we should accept his understanding of physics. Um, it's that if we, want to under, if we want to understand life, uh, we're going to be dealing with, with teleology and with form. And these are philosophical concepts uh, that empirical science and quantitative mathematical measure and formula can't help you very much with. Uh, it requires thinking in a more existential way. And uh, you know, anyone who's interested in any of the, the authors I've mentioned, like uh, um, um, Matrana and Vervela or Luantin, um, send me a message and I'll send you some appropriate material to read. But uh, yeah, thanks for listening.